Hi, everyone. <sighs> what do I tell you about first? I'm a genetic engineer, which means I literally work in the world of programming biology. I'm trained in genetics and cell biology, which also means that I'm really not that much fun at parties. Most people don't understand what I do. They can't see what I work on. It's really generally unfamiliar to most people. I also work at a place called Singularity University. This is a place where I helped create the life science program, and I felt I had to do it because most of the universities that teach things like genetics and cell biology are very backward-looking. I was interested in where this stuff is going to go to the future. It's also a pretty cool place because it's based in California at NASA, and it's the only school that I know of that has its own airfield. At the school, we basically talk about exponential change, technologies that move very quickly. We've, you know, we're familiar with these technologies now; they're all around us. They really started with the transistor, and over 50 or 60 years. Has taken us to this point where we literally have supercomputers in our pocket. Exponential change is radically transforming the world. It's showing us how we're connected. This is literally a map of the internet. It's it's physically connecting our world with fiber optics, our nations. It's showing how we're personally connected to other people. This is quite revolutionary, giving us new perspectives on our cities. From above and on our planet, and now we're taking it deeper. We're starting to scan everything, creating a, a digital world that mirrors the real world. People and actors, even objects. You can now just scan objects with your cell phone, convert them to point clouds, and manipulate them, modify them in software, and even print them. Scan, modify, print—all with these technologies using these home 3D printers. Taking word processing really into three dimensions, and this is just the start. The Internet of Things will connect virtually every device that you can imagine around us over the next while. By the, the by around 2023, it's calculated that a typical computer will have about the same processing capacity as the human brain, which is completely remarkable. And by 2050, perhaps all human brains. We're not going to be the dominant thinking species on the planet anymore, at least in terms of computational horsepower. Wow, like that's just wow. I don't know what that means for our species. I also like to talk about. Another revolutionary exponential technology that we generally completely ignore, and it's called life. Life is a lot different than the computer world, but it works. It works so well we don't even notice it. This is my favorite life form. It's a bacterium. It's the bacterium that are in your intestines. It digests your food. We've had a, a long relationship with this organism. It's one of the oldest organisms on the planet, E. coli. What we know now, what a whole generation is coming to learn, is that life, those cells, actually are very much like computers. They process chemical information in a highly parallelized way, and they actually have architectures very similar to the computer systems that we've built out in the real world. So much so that we can actually start to draw these comparisons. And if I sit down with a young person today and start talking about cells using the language of computers, they completely get it. They get it. It's the older people that don't. The cell is a machine, a really, really complicated machine. And the reason why it's complicated, well, there's a lot of moving parts. Way more. Than an automobile engine, way more than all the bits in an airplane, even more complicated than something like the Large Hadron Collider. It's so complicated 
that even with our best supercomputers today, we can't figure it out. And it does something that no other computer system today can do, which is it can make more of itself. Cells duplicate. This is just bacteria growing. You start with one bacterial cell, and overnight you'll end up with billions. And if your cell phone div divided just once per day, <laughs> you'd have 10 million in a month, and you'd put Apple out of business. The cell is beautiful. These are videos by a, by a photographer by the name of Craig Smith. Absolutely stunning. Just, this is a simple worm. Look at the complexity in this organism. This, this is a few thousand cells. We're trillions of cells. We're, we're an internet that we can't understand, made of computers that are still completely beyond our imagination. But there's one thing that gives me a lot of hope, and that's DNA. Because DNA is the software that runs all this stuff. And we're getting pretty good at software. Also, it's completely unambiguous. It's the only thing in the cell that you can fish out and read precisely. So, but it's different software than what we're used to with computers, because it's software that makes its own hardware, which is a lot like software that, or 3D printers that make their own printing. Printers. We're at the start of something that I like to call digital biology, because we're digitizing everything. This is not your old school biology where you took something that was working perfectly, kill it, and take it apart. This is going right down to the code. And now we have machines about the size of laser printers that sit on your desk and can churn out a human genome for $1,000. This was science fiction five years ago. Now it's off the shelf, and it's getting smaller. It's becoming a USB stick-sized device. You can see where this is going. It'll be on your cell phone soon enough. Human genome, instantly. BGI in China is sequencing three million genomes over the next few years. Three million. Drop in the bucket. But it's opening up a vast new data set. And not just human genomes, microbial genomes. It took another 12 years after the Human Genome Project before we started looking at the microbes inside of us and on us. These are the organisms that really we came from. We're also getting to the point where we're modifying this stuff. It's not just scanning. We're actually building CAD systems, computer-aided design tools for biology. It's just software. You don't have to go into a lab anymore. And the really cool thing with DNA is we're also making printers for it. These are literally chemical printers for DNA. You can use DNA as a structural material, but you know you can use it as a programming material because every living thing is made out of it. That's powerful stuff. That's a powerful tool. And the cool thing is if you can type, and most of you can, you can be a genetic engineer. It's that simple. You're just not going to be a good one for a while. <laughs> the idea that life can be programmed, just like the idea that computers are going to outthink us, is, is absolutely revolutionary. What do we do with this technology? Well, we start building bottom up. Hello, world. Hello, world is a virus. We're already a couple a few weeks ago, there was a brilliant paper where, where some students at Stanford engineered a virus to be like a data packet in biological networks. It's literally using viruses in ways we've never imagined before, but it, what biology does every day, biology is connected through viruses. We're starting to learn how to use viruses to do interesting things like kill cancer cells hunt down microbes that we don't want. They're some of the best antibiotics in the world, and all very natural and programmable. This is so cool. Of course, we've already made synthetic life forms, bacterial cells, but now there's companies starting to appear that will just do it as a service. This is literally the organism is the product. What do you want to make?
This is big business too. Other groups are getting into it on a, on a scale that will rival Exxon one day. And this is the organism I love the most because most of you have worked with it. This is baker's yeast. This is, when you buy it in the store, it's freeze-dried, it's dead, it's powder. You add water, it boots up. Isn't that cool? And the things you can make with it, bread and beer. Like, we all know how to do this. We've been doing it for 10,000 years. Beer created civilization. <laughs> and now we're getting to the point where we're making completely synthetic yeast. This is a joint U.S.-China project. It is tremendous. And it's not science fiction. The papers have already come out. You can replace entire parts of the yeast genome with synthetic DNA. It works perfectly. And once we have a fully synthetic yeast, I can only imagine the stuff that we're going to port to that organism. Things are going to get a little weird as genetic engineering comes up to speed. This is the new IT industry. It's literally the new field of computing. And it's a young field, and it's attracting crazy, interesting, brilliant developers. We've already made things like glow-in-the-dark cats. We've already done brain interfaces with mice, literally being able to talk to their brains directly. Now we're starting to explore other worlds to see what microbes or life forms might be there. I think, I think we'll find microbes on Mars. I've got a bet riding on this. But how cool is that, sending a two-ton biolab to another planet? We're starting to play with this stuff, too. Oh, my God! No, and I'm serious. Oh, my God! <laughs> Where does this take us? I, I don't know. I love looking at it. I just know it's not this idea of the scientist. In fact, most people, if you say, who's a scientist? You can't name one. Google top 10 scientists, they're all dead. They're, I'm not kidding. This is an era where we will have rock star scientists because it'll look a lot more like computing. Here's some of the people I've been working with over the last decade. Really, it's been a decade now. There's been 10,000 students go through a program at MIT from all around the world called iGEM that teaches kids, literally high school students, first and second year undergraduates, how to do this type of genetic programming. And eventually, it'll go down to grade schools. We're already seeing the appearance of community labs, like labs you can just go to. I'm surprised there's probably one here. For $100 a month, you can go to this one in New York and learn biotechnology. You don't need a PhD, they'll teach you, hands-on. We're seeing garage biotechs pop up. This one was a short ways from Singularity University, literally opened up in a garage, got funded, got turned into a real biotech company. This fellow, Cathal Garvey in Ireland, I love him. He set up his own biotech in a bedroom. It's licensed, too. He did it right. This is a paradigm shift equal to what computing was to society. We know how much computing changed the world. This is biotech for everybody. Everybody that wants to get into it. Everybody willing to learn. It also takes us way past Darwin. Darwin's dead. Darwin was natural selection. But now we're in the loop. Humanity's in the loop. That means we're into post-Darwinian biology, where we have to think about what we want to create and live with. That's a big responsibility. But I think we're up for it. If this stuff scares you, good. Seriously. I know everyone's worried about frankenfoods. Mm, move beyond it, seriously. We need food to live. Also, we're going to start seeing genetic engineering of foodstuffs to make products you actually want. Literally, foods that are medicines, foods that are healthier, foods that are tastier, foods that are just weird that celebrity chefs will want to use. Privacy, big issue. This is a whole data set that no one's ever played with before, and it reaches deep, deep into the core of you and me, everybody, every living thing. I don't know how that works. People are afraid of infections. People always say to me, is this stuff dangerous? 
It's like, what are you talking about? Do you have any idea how many microbes are in you and on you right now? Why do you think scientists are going to go and try and engineer nasty ones and go do, well, maybe they will, on government contracts. But look at what we're doing to the world with the technologies we have today. We're literally choking ourselves. We're killing our oceans. This is from Midway Island, photographer Chris Jordan. This is about as far away from humanity as you can get. And the crap that washes up kills birds. We're, we're, we need to change the way we do things. And what I love about biotechnology, what I love about this stuff, and why I think we need to engineer it, is because life is green. We're, life is made from the same stuff that we are. And if we can't grow the stuff that we need to sustain us, then we can't sustain ourselves. Life is clean. It's not a factory in China spewing out crap. So get involved with this stuff. It's called synthetic biology. It's a terrible name. It sounds really inorganic. But it's important. It's as important as computing is to your lives. And who knows? I think it might save your life one day. Learn about this stuff. You don't have to learn it all now. You're going to hear a lot more about it, but pay attention. For those of you that are makers, go, go out and make, go create with this technology. You'll love it. It's addictive. And like computing, you know, recognize that genetic engineering is here to stay. It's, it's not going to go away. You know, we might as well learn how to get good at it. I mean, really good. Thank you.